everyone. Welcome. This is Edwin Overa from edwinovera.com, aka the successful freelance dancer. Saturday interview session. Woohoo! Here we go. We have Christopher Harrison, the founder and president of Anti Gravity Inc., the father of aerial yoga, fitness expert, director, choreographer, and Broadway aerial designer. Now, I just want to say big thanks to Kyle Osier for getting me connected with uh, Christopher. It's um, I've, I'm so happy to have this this opportunity. So honored to interview a gentleman who's not only a creative genius but also one heck of a, an entrepreneur. And what he's done with his company, his brand, um, is something to to take a look into for those of you who are young artists, performers, dancers, or creative people who want to go out and see what you can do with your talents and not just uh, help enter you know not just entertain people but actually help and heal people with with your crafts and this gentleman has done a wonderful job. So here's some really interesting facts or pointers that came up during our interview session. When he was younger, Christopher was really inspired by Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire. He has a minor degree in kinesiology, so he really tro- truly understands the body and from inside and out. When he was younger, he blew at his knee during the America's first cheerleading competition on television. And he's inspired by social causes and a need to make sure that not not for us just to create art and beauty, but to also say something meaningful. In over 25 years, anti-gravity has had an impeccable history of not having a single injury which was caused by accident base. This is due to their model of learning, which is teaching technique incrementally. Anti-gravity began in 1991 in NYC as a confederacy of gymnastic athletes who yearned to continue their love of the flip after competitive years. Assembled by world-class gymnastic specialist and Broadway dancer Christopher Harrison, his style merged athletic power with creativity of dance. Together, Team Anti-Gravity became America's pioneer of contemporary acrobatics and aerial arts. Along the path of his passion, Christopher made numerous discoveries about the body and the mind, which he compiled into methodology and philosophy. His health and wellness creations, which emerged from his company's warm-up, are known as anti-gravity fitness techniques. Now considered a leader in the global expansion of the field of movement and an expert in the field of fitness. Harrison's groundbreaking creations and kinetic inventions have inspired health and happiness through innovative performance and exercise technique around the world. Some of his clients who have used his anti-gravity fitness are celebrities such as Pink, Britney Spears, Gwyneth Paltrow, Richard Branson, Madonna, Katie Couric, Natalie Portman, Dan Brown, Khloe Kardashian. Christopher, thank you so much for your time. I'm so excited to have spent it with you, uh, just one hour of your time, getting to know you more about who you are and share your story. And I can't wait for us to share this um, to my audience and to the people who have been following you over the last 25 years. Thank you, be well, and enjoy this interview session. You know, when was the first time that you noticed or your family noticed that you were going to be a mover at, you know, early on, whether it was like, uh, a, a teenager or a preschooler or even like in college level. So when did you find that you had a natural gift with talent and movement? Well, uh, I tell this story that when I was a little kid, my mother tells the story actually. When I was a little kid, I used to dream that I could fly. And every morning I would wake up and I, could say, I would say, Mom, I can fly. I, I know I can. I, I know I can. And she never told me I couldn't. Instead, she said, go practice. <laughs> so I would go out in the backyard and I would swing on a vine or, or rather on a rope or I would, you know, climb trees and I would jump and, and one day I jumped so high that I did a backflip and she's like, okay, we got to do something with this kid. And, and we also had like a culture in my family of acrobatics. Don't ask me why. In this little Mormon town in Brigham City, Utah, we had a culture of acrobatics, I guess because my mom did it when she was a little kid. And so we would flip around in the living room and I was, I had a very flexible back naturally. So I could, I could do a lot. She saw that I had uh, quite a bit of skill, and so she, um, so she put me in the state fair. And she had me do like a little routine. <laughs> she taught me one dance step, and she says, okay, just do this dance step whenever you don't know what else to do, and then just keep doing all your flips. And she took the family rug, like a little circular rug, and she took it to the state fair, and she had me just, she turned on her, her Balbert and the Tijuana Brass, and I did this little impromptu dance number at eight years old with a little sailor hat that she put my name on and I won first place. My God. <laughs> I know. And so she said, okay, well, I think I better do something with this. So she put me into gymnastics and in Brigham City, Utah, they don't have men's gymnastics. They just basically had tumbling. And I was, of course, the only boy in the class. And, uh, and, and she put me there because my older brother's name was Wynn and he was good at football and basketball and baseball and winning everything, Yeah, Wynn. which... 
which meant that 18 months younger, I was kind of loose. And so she felt sorry for me a little bit and put me into gymnastics classes. And I, uh, I wanted so badly to have something that I could do that I had that was, that was, that made me feel okay about who I was. Um, and so I really excelled. I really, really excelled at it. And I wound up, uh, I wound up going to the World Games eventually um, in my sport. But along the way, I, I didn't just stay with one thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, she put me into little theater productions. You know, I did, I did Oliver and, and uh, uh, King and I and shows like that as a kid. And, and it's kind of the Mormon culture that you really, you, you don't hide your candle under a bushel, she would say. <laughs> And so we, we did a lot of, um, I did a lot of theater. And then when I was 13, I auditioned for Peter Pan, and I got cast in the role of Peter Pan. And so uh, playing that at age 13 uh, was a great experience, and I think they kind of saw that there was certainly some talent there. It was a little frustrating because they didn't have the money to fly me, and so instead of, instead of flying me as Peter Pan, um, they would just have me flip and tumble. So I would say, I'm flying, and then I would tumble, tumble, tumble. tumble. Say, <laughs> Did you ever have to do like one of those long crossings like in tumbling where you're tumbling, 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 and then you do like triple and then you land, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, my that God. was my sport. That was my sport. In fact, my uh, one of my passes that I competed on was Russian front, round up, flip up, whip, 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 flip up, whip, 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 flip up, full punch front. <laughs> I know that means like nothing to somebody who doesn't know what it is, but yeah. this was back in the, uh, in the <clears throat> uh, 70s. So uh, it was something for them. And I am known as the very first person. So I don't get credit for it. The very first person ever to do a standing back full twist on a balance beam. Since we didn't wow. have uh, since we didn't have uh, male apparatus, I would play around on the women's apparatus. And uh, and way early on, I did a, a standing. I had a standing back full twist, and I did it on a balance beam. So anyway, <laughs> you know, I give you so much kudos to be able to balance in such a small. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to play around with that stuff when it's on the floor, like, of, you know, literally, like, oh, I, I can't even imagine being up there, like, just tumbling. And tum <laughs> oh, my goodness. You, you know, who inspired you at that age, especially in the tumbling? Was there, like, a mentor or figure, um, a teacher that, you know, like, really helped help you in your craft, especially understanding momentum and the physics, physics of learning how to do a, a twist or a flip or how to absorb shock? Who, who inspired you then? Well, um... I, the funny thing is my training was very much acrobatics and dance and gymnastics all at the same time. So I was put into a, to Roselle's, Roselle Henry's uh, tap and acrobatics classes when I was very young. And, um, and what I a fusion. She would, <laughs> and she would have, uh, the, she would have um, Gene Kelly images everywhere. And so I remember seeing Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire and being motivated by them as a dancer. And then I saw uh, Nadia Comaneci get her perfect 10 as a gymnast. So really that simultaneously it was, it was both of, it was both of those, uh, you know, Gene Kelly was my, was my hero. I always, I saw him do gotta dance and sing in the rain. And all I wanted to do was just, you know, dance and, and be athletic like he was as a dancer. And he was so grounded. I watched a lot of movies when I, when I first got into the dancing realm after the military, after, you know, the stint in my military career. Um, I watched a lot of movies on Gene Kelly because I loved his, his um, I don't know, athletic approach. And, you know, he made that one series, I think it was like um, A World of Dance or something weird like that where it was like showing how regular sports, whether it was in baseball or somebody throwing, you know, like rolling a bowling ball, like how it could apply to move, just to generate movement. And that, you know, why is there a separation between the two? And I thought it was pretty interesting, you know. Yeah, and well, and plus he did all of his own stunts. Oh, so that all made me. I wanted to do all of it, you know. So it's it's never been for me. Oh, I'm just going to dance, or I'm just going to flip. I always I always wanted to explore the concept of movement. So dance for me is is not a it's not a limited term that term that means only ballet or modern or tap or jazz or but or hip hop. It uh, it means more um, anything that I mean. For example, when you see birds flying through the air in formation, I see that as dance. Mm. Um, when we take when we take performers up into the air and as we as we do aerial arts, it's very much aerial dance. And um, and when I even choreograph my acrobatic uh, performances, even though they may not necessarily be doing 
traditional dance steps. It's all choreographed tightly to music, mm. and so it's so I consider it dance. It's a broader term for me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, I mean, again, you you are making people glide through space with these apparatuses with ease. You know, at least what the audience is uh, having the impression on. Um, yesterday, I watched a video of the, what you did for the 2012 uh, Victoria's Secret thing, and I was like, oh. You had you had the guys on the stilts. I also do stilt walking too, like part time if somebody hires me for it. Um, so it was funny to see, it was to see how all these different um, forms of movement, from large scale type puppetry to aerial arts to circus performing, like all of it is fused in. And in what would um, at first glance like oh Victoria's Secret hiring talent for that? Absolutely. I mean this is what people want to be entertained. So there's and and you're a perfect candidate to supply that service. You know. Um, well, thank. You. That was a that was a real fun one. Needless to say, um, but uh, you know, we're, I, I don't consider myself at all a, a, a circus performer, and I don't have a circus. But yeah. we definitely dabble in the circus arts, mm. um, and, um, and I've staged a few circuses. So when they asked me to do Victoria's Secret Fashion Show, they wanted me to come up with a pop circus, and mm. they wanted it to be retro style. So um, and they wanted to fill up the air as well as the floor with as much movement as possible. Um, and there was a lot. To show- <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Showcase all these beautiful women and beautiful costumes. Needless to say, it was uh, it was definitely one to go down in history. It was fun. Yeah, absolutely. Now you need to, you talked earlier about when you were the Peter Pan character, and then many years later you actually were a part of Peter Pan again on Broadway. How was that like? Uh, or like uh, or not Broadway, but like um, what was it in the New Jersey? Very good. Paper Mill Play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How was it? Now you're given. Did you have harnesses or you know the pulley system to have people going up? Oh yeah, we actually we absolutely did. Um, that one I was uh, choreographing more than I was directing. Yeah. Um, and I was mostly doing the acrobatic choreography for it, but but the concept for that particular production that was very interesting by Robert Johansson, um, was was to do was to have all the lost boys be acrobats. Mm. And so we got to play. I, so I basically they hired anti gravity my company. I came in and got to stage that part of it. But you know Peter Pan's always a uh, always a part of my life. You know once you played the role. He's kind of there, and, uh, and you get to remind yourself that you're never going to grow up, <laughs> and, uh, and you get to always believe that never, never land is there. I and mean, what do I actually do now for a living? Uh, one of the things that I do is I teach people how to fly. I yeah. get to fly the celebrities on big award shows and in studios around the world. I teach them how to get into a hammock and turn upside down and, and fly. So it, in a way, I think that the role influenced me. <laughs> I wrote I wrote this quote down and it's somewhere over here. What does it say? Um, about your obsession. Yeah, I spent my life I spent my life challenging the laws of gravity to the point of obsession. As in, you want to people need to go up in the air. How are you going to do it? No matter what. And the fact that you just kept thinking about it, think about, it, and now all these years later, you're you're getting some of the A list talent to literally going up, and also uh, um, utilizing your apparatus that you created. You know the whole. The Harrison Hammock and and the uh, different the different forms of uh, anti gravity um, uh, health uh, regimens that you have. Can you talk a little about about that about how you you got into it? I know that you said something. I read um, you went to India and in in India you had this like uh, what was it? Yeah, you made a deal with the universe. Let me remain physically active in my passion, and I will turn uh, in turn dedicate my life to sharing the knowledge I gain. Uh, this turned out to be the inception for anti-gravity era yoga and all anti-gravity fitness techniques. My journey continues, and my body is my teacher. Can you share more about that moment when that inspiration happened? Well, um, sure. The, the thing about the thing about being a dancer is you're always a dancer, no matter what. Yeah. And and I had the uh, unbelievable. Good fortune, I guess, of having some challenges that would require me to have to constantly be creative about how I was going to discover that. Meaning, uh, when I was just starting in my dance career, I blew out my my knee. And it said, you will never dance again, you'll never flip again, you'll never ski again. I was a big skier. And, uh, and I blew out pretty bad the ACL, and it was I was supposed to be in a production of Barnum at the time, so I, I had to I had to pull out. Uh, and it was doing it was I blew it out doing America's very first uh, cheerleading show, cheerleading competition on TV. And um, and after I blew it out, I I was like, well, what am I supposed to do if I'm not supposed to dance? Uh, this is everything I, I was in college. This is everything I meant to be. And they said, well, uh, 
and they said, well, you got to figure something else out. Well, I didn't. I rehabbed my knee, and I, I learned a lot about, about Pilates in the process. And I learned about the body and, and wound up with a minor in kinesiology. And, um, and then I went back to doing what I knew how to do, to dance. And then I blew out my other knee. And when I blew out the other knee, they said, listen, kid, you have no chance. There is no way you're going to be a dancer. There's no way that you're going to be a, uh, a, a be able to tumble again. You'll never run again. And uh, I went to my dad. I said, Dad, what do I do? Everything inside me says dance, flip, tumble, jump, fly. Uh, it's, it's what I'm meant to do. I know it. And he said, you know what? If this is your passion, then just make sure that every step you take leads in that direction. Hmm. So with, uh, with my knee in a cast and a year to go in physical therapy, I bought myself a one-way ticket to New York City. And I said, I'm going to dance on Broadway. Now, I'd never been anywhere near Broadway. I didn't even know what it really meant. I just remember Gene Kelly going, God, I dance. And, uh, and I made that choice. And then I just made every step going that direction. Well, the body has constantly been my teacher in that it talks sometimes rather loudly to me. And, um, and when I was in India with the company, we were performing for, uh, I did the opening number for the Miss India pageant. And at that time I was performing with my company as well as choreographing it. And my body pretty much was like done by the end of that performance. I, you know, spinal stenosis of the neck, my back was out, my knees, wrists, just, I was a mess. And they said, you know what? Go to, um, go to Kerala and learn about Ayurveda medicine. Maybe that can help you. So I sent the company home and I stayed and I found yoga. And I realized that, oh, wow, you don't just have to move fast and big and strong. And you can actually, that you can move slowly and with intention. And that is as much dancing as it is when you're dancing balls to wall, so to speak. You know, and, um, and so suddenly I, I developed a yoga practice. And I found that that influenced my dance immensely. And it influenced me as a choreographer. And um, simultaneously, I said, well, since... Um, tumbling on the floor is going to be hard. Let's take it up in the air. And we got a contract with Exit Nightclub in New York City. Um, it's now called Terminal, and it had 40-foot ceilings. And uh, and at that time, remember, this was back in the late 90s. There weren't aerial arts anywhere except for in circus. It wasn't any place else. And, uh, and I had been in Brazil, and I'd been in a hammock, and I loved a hammock. And I said, you know, what if we put people in hammocks up over the audience? Hmm. It's nightclub, and, and there were 3,000 people who'd come in, they'd be drunk out of their minds, and they'd look up and they'd see us in these hammocks and go, whoa, what is that? While we were there, I turned upside down and realized, oh, wow, I can get the kinks out of my back. Mm. So then I put them in the house and put it at the same height as a, as a ballet bar at the, at the bottom of it, or the, hung it from the ceiling, and the bottom is the same height as the ballet bar, which is ironically the same height as an uneven bar in gymnastics. And I kind of combined those... Uh, those different modalities that I had from Pilates and gymnastics and, and dance and yoga and, um, and aerial arts, and I put it into this technique that, um, that kept my body moving. And what I discovered is that all the compression injuries that I had had, they kind of went away and they were fine as long as I was turning my body upside down and creating space in them through decompression exercises. So... Um, in 2011, well, 2007, I started this technique. In 2009, I, I launched it. But really, uh, after the after the 2011 tour, we toured through Brazil, and I took the company through all the different fine arts studio places in in America. And I said, you know, I'm going to put my time towards this right now. And so I've been putting my focus much more towards anti gravity uh, fitness techniques, and those have integrated. Uh, so I have anti-gravity yoga, mm -hmm. I have anti-gravity suspension fitness, I have anti-gravity Pilates, I have anti-gravity air bar, which is crazy fun, the stuff you do with the bar, but you do it with an anti-gravity Harris, an anti-gravity hammock, and, um, and I have anti-gravity restorative and, and others. I'm about to go to Japan to finish the, my work on anti-gravity massage. Oh my goodness, wow. It's Well, here's the thing, you, I'm answering your question in a roundabout way, Yeah. because because the truth is, being in a body that has had its share of challenges means that I constantly have to get creative. And when I had to let go of my double back pike and I could never do it again, I said, okay, but I've got to learn something else. 
When I could no longer do my standing full, I said, I've got to find something else. When I could no longer, you know, feel like I could do the jetés across the floor that I used to do that were just whack big jetés, I said, okay, well, then I'm going to find something else. And so instead of subtracting, you're constantly um, reinventing. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and that way, my life is the life of a movement artist. And dance is one of those beautiful branches that I have. It's interesting when you're talking about like these, you know, the fact that you couldn't do these certain moves, but you're replicating, you're replicating them in your hammock when you, because people, a lot of people don't ever get the sensation of inversion or even complete suspension or the fact that you're teetering or trying to find balance just on a small point. People don't feel that, and, and but you felt it all for many years of your life, and the fact that you've created this 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 hammock to help people or even to help yourself go through. Um, those motions with with ease, with grace, and still strengthen yourself without breaking yourself down is pretty brilliant, man. <laughs> well, thank you. Necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. Um, we have a we have a right now. I have an, uh, the Anti Gravity Theater is in Orlando. Yeah. And and there we have shows that we're putting up. We just did an Aerial Nutcracker, and, and we just did a, an Aerial Rocky Horror, and we've got an Aerial Moulin Rouge coming up. Um, and uh, and also there we have the Anti-Gravity National Training Center for the Aerial Arts. So people get to train on um, dancing bungees, which is another one of my creations, on anti-gravity boots, um, on the anti-gravity hammock, on uh, a three-dimensional cube. So we have all kinds of apparatus you can train on there. And, and we also have a, a studio, but uh, a studio for uh, anti-gravity fitness techniques. Oh, got it. But basically, but basically my objective is to move the body three dimensions as much as possible in as many unique ways as possible. So choreography can happen on wheels. Choreography can happen on springs. Um, I did choreography once uh, 2,000 feet up in the air hanging from a, an anti-gravity hammock from a, a paraglider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's all, it's all dance. It's all dance. And so you find other ways to express yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I'm just thinking about the height of, uh, you know, being gliding in the air and then doing your stuff. But hey, it's a... Uh... What? It didn't bother my knees. It didn't bother my neck. And I still got that adrenaline rush and that and that and and the job of creating something artistically that was going to be beautiful and captured. And um, and that's it. So it's all dance. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, what is inspiring you now as... As a being, as a person, as a, a businessman, um, you know, what is inspiring you, whether it's, you know, a good book or, you know, there's a trend going on in, in, in just in general public, like what is, what is fueling your creative juices lately, whether it's a book, music, or what's going on socially? First of all, it's, it's living in New York. You know, I'm yeah. constantly going out and seeing everything I was at. I just saw the George O'Keefe exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum this mm -hmm. last week. You know, I've been seeing all, and I see as many shows as I can and as many different things, but not just uptown, also down, down yeah. and in Williamsburg, you know. So I'll go to the House of Yes and see what they're doing there. Mm -hmm. And whenever I travel to foreign countries, which I, I, I do a lot now since anti-gravity is in 50 different countries, um, so I'll go around and wherever I go, I find what's happening and what's new and what's edgy, usually with the youth culture. Mm -hmm. So what is inspiring me right now more than anything is the youth of today. I'm interested to know, I have a lot of nieces and nephews, they're all millennials. <laughs> Just stay with Uncle Chris and do internships with me. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm fascinated with, with uh, especially their music and music festivals, and music festival scene. I'm fascinated with fashion. Um, and, uh, and on the whole, I think, that, I think that when you look for inspiration, you have to constantly be looking Outside of um, outside of where you would what what might be um, considered say uh, standard, you have to you have to be pushing boundaries the same way that you do as, as a movement artist. You're always pushing the boundaries. Well, you do the same thing when it comes to inspiring your muse. I will uh, I will go to great lengths to constantly inspire my muse. If ever I feel like I'm starting to get stagnant, I'll get on my Segway and I'll put on a crazy and go get in a parade and push my boundaries and do something that's uncomfortable for myself until I screw another barrier and discover something more. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, it's um, I found the same because I, I travel quite a bit 
just from the last 11 years and I always found myself going into a new area, something new, like the fact that, um, or sitting in an area that somebody would never want to be around, maybe because they, they feel like it's uh, too impoverished or whatever, but I think there's there's a lot to be seen there that's, that, because the average person would walk by, they would miss the opportunity of like really looking and being present in that in that area. So I'll go into like impoverished areas, I'll go into communities that normally I don't hang out with, or I'll go into different art museums, or I'll go to different hotels or different restaurants that um, uh, some people are like, oh, you know, you, you shouldn't be going in there. And I'm like, I don't care. I'll just go with my hat, my backpack, and sit. And, you know, I'm constantly yeah. going to new places to keep pushing the, the my mental barrier of, like, your comfort zone of, like, I just want to keep expanding and keep growing and keep reaching out, you know? Eleanor Roosevelt said it. She said that if you want to grow, you have to do something that scares you every single day or something like that. And, uh, and so I, I do. I push those boundaries all the time. Um, I'm, so I'm also really fascinated by, like, like, I'll buy a lot of different art books and see what yeah. other artists have done, and I'm inspired by literature. I just read the book Cleopatra. <laughs> it was long. It was big. But you get to, you suddenly, your head goes to a whole other world, another sphere. Um, and I'm certainly inspired right now by uh, my social causes and and by a need to make sure that that we use art to not just create beauty, but to say something. When you're, what was it that Carrie Fisher said that Meryl Streep so famously um, quoted? She said uh, something, it sounds like something like this. Uh, if you have a broken heart, make art. So right now, uh, because, of the, because of the challenges I think that we're having in our political system and on, and on this planet, uh, that's really what is motivating me. And certainly the next show that, that I have coming out is going to, is going to bring together um, not only some social causes, but also the youth culture. That's 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 really where my head is at right now. Got it. What's what's one or two things that you're trying to learn for yourself as a person, and then also like as a businessman or an entrepreneur? Well, um, as a person right now, I'm studying Japanese. Watashi wa nihongo o suko I don't know what you said. I love languages. I love languages. I'm going to be spending uh, anti-gravity fitness techniques are blowing up in Japan. I'm going to be spending some time there, so I've been studying Japanese. Um, wow. And, uh, um, and I'm, I'm also something I'm very interested in is how to make the how to make the business that I've created uh, not just profitable for myself, but for everyone who comes and becomes an instructor. So we're working really hard to get dancers who are interested in having a future career to find our techniques and then to create a pathway for them that's going to support them so that as they're pursuing their dance, they have something that they can also be doing, they can be teaching, or something that they can grow into no differently than, than I did. And we found that dancers are, are actually really loving it, um, that, that, that I'm creating... So entrepreneurially, I want to create a really solid pathway for uh, dancers and athletes and yogis to uh, to make a good living or to make a side living through the through the anti gravity fitness techniques. So it's mostly about tightening up that model. Got it. That's that's that's, that's the uh, that's what we're working. On. And in some extent, it, it sounds just a little bit like a like um, a, a franchise. Like if if this it, not necessarily a franchise, but like the the, the if the talent if the instructor is wanting to maybe grow more for themselves within the company, if they maybe buy a portion of it and be a franchise in a sense, and then start their own studio, which has all of your techniques that you've developed over these years, and then they can implement it in their own individual studio. Am I correct? That's Similar? That's exactly it. And we have over 550 places that are uh, that have our techniques in them throughout the world right now, and over 5,000 certified anti-gravity instructors. When, when did that... Um, who was a person, or who was, a, if you could, you know, mention who um, helped you with the understanding about that, about the ability to franchise or the ability to, um, you know, intelli uh, intellectual properties of, of your concepts to, to learn them and then to like look more than it just being a, spe a spectacle, but actually like, hey, you can you can package this, you can you can market it, you can distribute it, you know, like who was, or, or is there a good book? Because I read a lot of, <laughs> I'm reading a lot of books about business and. And uh, entrepreneurship. I mean, I, I'm I'm so fascinated about that. Is equally as my creative endeavors, because they go hand to hand. Whether you're creating a service and then you're trying to sell it or market it, 
and telling people that you even exist um, is, is equally as fascinating being on stage and performing in front of thousands of people. I think they go, like for me, because I'm so curious, I'm always wondering, like, what happens next? Who do I reach? What do I call? You know, it's... Sorry if I'm a madman for a second, but... Well, no, I, I got to tell you something, Edwin. You're doing the right thing, because I, I don't think that nowadays, unless you're extraordinarily talented, I don't think you can go in and, and make a, a career as just a, a dancer. I think you yeah. really have to be resourceful. And if you're waiting for somebody to do it for you, it's not going to happen. It's just so great. You have to say, okay, how am I going to make it happen? And if it doesn't happen the way that I've envisioned it in my mind, then how can I get creative to have it happen another way? Had I just stuck with my, my one goal of dancing on Broadway and that's all I did, I, not only would I did I have a short shelf life uh, because of my, my body, but also it, it, it wouldn't have been nearly as exciting. So like when I first came to New York, I would only go to equity auditions and I didn't want to do anything that was non-equity. And I, I really lost out on so many opportunities. And the minute that I opened my mind and said, okay, where else can my talents go? If I'm following my passion, where else can it lead? I started to have opportunities. I wish I could say I had someone who guided me the whole way. I can't. I went to the school of hard knocks. That's what I mean. And error. Just you figure it out as you go. But yeah. luckily, I, I, um, I'm very good at gathering good people around me. Yeah. And um, and one of the uh, one of the great dancers of, of New York City, Alex Schlemp, who uh, graduated from Juilliard, was one of my good friends. He went uh, having a great dance career and then performing for my company, and um, and eventually moved him into an executive position. And now he we just celebrated uh, just a couple of days ago our 17th year as partners. So uh, when you have somebody that you can that you share an affinity with and you can bounce ideas off of them and you can kind of brainstorm it and then you can. Uh, find other people within your circles that you can ask questions to, very often you figure it out. Um, I'm not going to say we didn't make a lot of mistakes along the way or get sidetracked, <laughs> but um, but from everything we learned. You know, I, I had a, an agency for a while here in New York. Did you know that? I had no idea. No, I, it was, no. What happened is after I started the company Anti-Gravity, it was America's first contemporary acrobatic performance company. So we were just in demand everywhere. We had a contract at Radio City Music Hall. Um, for three years, we were at Metropolitan Opera House as their in-house company. We were on in numerous Broadway shows. We popped open the market for the events world and then uh, for rock tours. And uh, it was just we were high demand. Yeah. Yeah, we really we really found a lot of success. But um, but uh, along that way, at the same time that we were doing it, we found uh, I, I found that um, that Alex and I had to really say you know where else can we, all, we're always looking for where else can this go. So for example, we found Lois Greenfield yeah. and she's a photographer and she, she learned how to capture us in mid motion in the air. And our collaborations there led to some beautiful um, campaigns. And then we found, uh, and then we found that we, you know, we got to know Mark Jacobs and he had these crazy budgets for these crazy parties in the nineties when there was all this money <laughs> and, uh, and he would hire us and we'd hire like a hundred people and do giant shows with huge production values. And then there was Broadway Bears, you know, and I knew Jerry Mitchell from my dancing days, and um, and he said the very the very first year of Broadway Bears, the second show, um, uh, Pacho and I, he was my partner at the time, did a did like the first acrobatic duet that Broadway had ever seen. Really? And it, yeah, and it was very much, um, you know, a same-sex romantic duet for Broadway Bears, so it was like, woo, kind of... Back then, it was a big deal. Um, you know, this was 90, oh gosh, 93, 92. Yeah. It was a really big deal. Um, but we but we wound up just uh, really kind of exploring. Every, we wound up doing Broadway Bears, actually, for 12 years and, and, and creating great, big, beautiful production numbers for that. That was a that was a, a great thing to do with Jerry Mitchell. And um, anyway, I think I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Where was my threat? No, it was just like... Um... Uh, originally, we were all talking about uh, this whole thing started about the entrepreneurship drive. You know, like where did you find it? And you said it, it's it came from just life. And and when if you don't have someone who's who's been doing that, uh, like for example, my parents, um, my father has has the had the entrepreneurship drive, but never had the logistics of keeping track of his finances. So after all these years, now he's in his sixties and he's suffering because he couldn't be able to to keep his books correct. You know. And and that's 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 really sad to see. Uh, so I, I that's where my initial drive came from about being a freelancer, and some of it was just replicating 
trying to replicate the systems by visually seeing them and taking action of what a, a company of Palabalus, you know, and what that institute does in the office. Because because I've had so many behind the scenes meetings with them, I had the chance to see if what does a company manager do? What does the the um, production team have to work on? You know, my God, making the cold calls to uh, you know executive director making these calls are these big decisions that the dancers have no clue about, but hearing it f from another lens, like. I just was like a sponge absorbing all these different scenarios and realizing that, man, just being a dancer is just one small point if you're looking of what's going on above you in order for you to have this career as a dancer on stage. And I became mindful of it. Well, that's, that's, that's literally the secret. Learn as many different aspects of the business so that there's always a place for you to go. Um, I'll, I'll sometimes use my dancers as... You know, they'll, they'll learn to operate motors sometimes. They'll learn to do rigging. They learn to be company managers. They learn to help with uh, with set design and, and with set creation and costume design. I'm always saying, let's, and I call them dancers, but they're really performers because some of them are more gymnasts than dancers. But, uh, but, what, but what I give them is the opportunity to come in and learn as much as they can about not just what they're doing on stage, but the industry around them. And what that's done is it's been able to create a, a whole lot of spin-offs that have taken the, the movement styles that I started with the company and the techniques I started with the company, and it's 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 made it so that now it's a, it's a thing, you know. Whereas aerial acrobatics really didn't really exist when I started back in 1990. Now almost every show has something. Some form of uh, <laughs> somebody's yeah, flying. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, it was a big awakening when dancers realized, oh, wow, I can do that? And yeah, okay, you might have to gain a little bit of upper body strength. You might have to learn how to move your body in three dimensions. Um, but we took dancers up into the air and we took and, and made them and, and taught them how to be not only safe, but, but graceful in, in flying, flying up high. And sometimes dancers look at it and they go, oh my gosh, I could never do that. I'd be too scared. But the truth is, every you know, we have an impeccable history. Anti gravity does an impeccable history. Not a single injury that we've ever had that was an accident based. You know, I'm not saying that you know people haven't stubbed their toe. I'm not saying people haven't injured their knees and things. But you know, dancers do. But we've yeah. never had an accident in over you know 25 years now. Um, and it's because every single thing that we do, we do incrementally. And as a dancer, it's no different. The same way that first you learn to walk, then you skip, then you hop, then you jump. Then you pirouette, then you jeté. Um, you, it's the same thing with the aerial arts. You start very low, and you discover your body in this plane of motion, and then if you take it up, you take it up. Um, but not aerial arts even has to be high up in the air. So I don't know. I, I'm very encouraging of dancers to expand their horizons wherever they can, to um, whether they're dancing on, on another, another person's body and more acrobatic stuff like Palabos does, who, by the way, were very influential for me moving to New York. I, uh, I had videos of them at the University of Utah when I was in school, and I saw yeah. their videos, and I said, I've got to go to New York to do that. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then later, I went and took a workshop from them. Um, I took a workshop from them, and I, and I, and I spoke to the, the creators afterwards. Uh, like, there was a group of three or four of them that met with me, very, you know, Allison. And, yeah. uh, anyway, they, and I said, look, I'm starting this company, Anti-Gravity. Do you have any advice for me? And they were the ones that convinced me to go for profit. They said, yeah, my advice is go for profit. It was a really hard decision to do that. Uh, but um, I think that it was the right, I know that it was the right choice. Absolutely. You know, that's something, that, thank you for bringing that up because there are not, as far as I know, and after looking at research a lot of companies, there's not many dance or movement-based companies that are for profit. A lot of them are not for profit. And, and at some, my, my only, um, my personal, like, seeing, uh, behind the scenes of certain nonprofit companies, not just Palalos, but others, uh, even here locally in Milwaukee, and hearing what happens sometimes when a person creates this this creative empire, right? Whether it's for the community or not, and then at a certain point when they succeed out of it, what happens next? Does the integrity still stay the same? You know what I mean? Like, do the, is it still being run to its to what the mission is, or has it been totally changed? And then and then you, and then they don't have control, and they can't they can't. Um, what I guess I'm trying to get at is that sometimes people it gets lost. It gets lost, and it's you you lose. Imagine if you build this beautiful, I don't know, like this beautiful piece of art, and you know that it was just kept 
for people to admire and enjoy and everything, and then somebody comes and just like breaks the arm and says, "Well, it's gonna look better this way." We just break the arm off the off the statue, and like, and that's what's gonna be that's gonna be new. To... It's very rare that you get to have uh, that you get to have all the integrity you want with any artistic piece, unless you are at the tip tip top of your game, and you have, or unless you have some huge funding behind you. At the end of the day, you're compromising whether you are a not for profit company who's pleasing patrons, yeah. Uh, or, uh, you know, and 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 the, and the arts company and the arts funding that you're going to get, or whether you're uh, whether you are um, commercially creating your art and and working for clients, you know. Um, so it's really more just a choice of like how do you maintain your integrity within yourself and what and, and within your style while you also create things that the audiences want to see. The problem with 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 a lot of dance in in, uh, in America is I think that it, it can become very self indulgent. <laughs> And, um, and a lot of times people are creating great things that, 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 that feel good to do and that maybe other dancers will want to do with them, but the audiences aren't that interested in. It's a much greater choice to push yourself as an artist to make art that's actually commercial and that people want to see. So, for example, if you go see the movie en Enchanted and there's a section in the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the park where there's all the dancing with Amy Adams and everything, and um, and and I got to work uh, on that on that on that piece with Cha Cha. He's an incredible incredible uh, choreographer, and, and I got to create the acrobatics part. That I was actually really fulfilled by the uh, by the choreography that that came from that, and by the people that saw it that loved it. So I got to take my nieces and nephews to see you know this this beautiful scene in Enchanted, and they just went, Oh my gosh, it's so cool. That to me, artistically, was as fulfilling as anything that I've done that is that that has been that hasn't necessarily been commercially based. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So about just putting your mindset to saying, you know what, I'm going to create something that people want to see, and I'm going to be. And when somebody gives me a barrier or a hoop to have to jump through, I'll just either work around the barrier or I'll jump through the hoop and figure out a way to make their no into my kind of a yes, so that you're still just always creating. And you're in the flow rather than in resistance. And that's a big thing that people are talking about, I would say, over the last 10 years. And even like, what is it, Harvard has been talking about getting into the state of flow, uh, the state of flow or the creative state, the mental state. It's important. Again, when you do get the barrier, how do you how do you go around it, right? Literally trying to physically go around it, go through it, or just say, eh, I'll just watch it from the side and do it like this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But another place you asked me about inspiration, another place that I really get inspired is by dancers and athletes themselves you know when, when I see someone who's been working on their form mm -hmm. and uh, and what and whatever it is um, and I see that they are actually committed to what they're doing and that they found uh, their own expression through it it makes me want to create something on them so uh, I'm, I'm always I'm always blown away by by the progress that's been made in in the world of, of, of dance and in acrobatics Absolutely, and there's and there's so much more fusion of stuff that's happening now lately. You know, I, I remember about 15 years ago looking at break dancers um, in these competitions, like in France and in Japan, and what they were doing. They were still pioneering American break dancing, you know, like or or, or break dancing in other parts. They just kept pushing the boundaries. And then now looking at it, just like um, a year ago, I saw a video online where these break dancers in like Japan and Korea were doing all this partnering stuff. That 10, 15 years ago, it didn't even exist. It was like they weren't even touching. They were just doing their individual flows. And now there's, I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, maybe I should talk to them. Like, how? Here's how you can make your techniques a little better. Here's how you can absorb weight. Here's how you can toss better. Well, it, uh, it's, it's basically what I've seen is is contact improv. Yeah. It's been and really, really exploding. And if you put contact improv and acrobatics together with people who understand dance and line, then you're starting to get something really magical. There's some cool companies out there doing really good really press stuff right now. Yeah, there's some there's some good stuff in uh, in uh, Canada and then also in, in Australia. They're doing pretty cool stuff. Yeah, let's be clear about this, okay? Yeah. Those are places where the government funding is enormous. In in Canada, what they do is you can be a non profit while you're there, and you can even get a salary um, and and have have your housing paid for while you are studying and learning your craft and while you're at uh, in the process of creation, and then as soon as you go into uh, a production, you are for profit, and you can have both companies at the same time. So, the the work that you see coming from other countries 
and, and what's happening over there and their ability to explore is just it far surpasses what, what we're able to do here in terms of the non-for-profit sector, that's for sure. Um, so I didn't. I felt like being an American. I, I didn't really have a choice to to choose not for profit. I didn't have the. I didn't have the the wealthy people around me who were going to be paying for for my style of art. And and the truth is, I think I, it feels like the the money that's out there, the little bit of money that the NEA gets from however much longer it goes get it, really yeah. goes for you know it goes for ballet, it goes for modern, it goes for opera, it goes for the things that are pretty much. Uh, you know, sanctioned, and that this little form of, of um, acrobatics is and aerials is very, very outside what people see as um, really even dance. They don't quite know what to name it. So I like being outside the boundaries. I like being the the person that they can't necessarily pay. They can't say they can't say, oh, it's this. Yeah. You know, and every single time that somebody's bigger me out, I turn a different direction and go another way. <laughs> I, I remember Jonathan Walken, one of the original members of, of Palabolus, he always says, you know, I don't give, he, like, he didn't, really didn't care what people thought, he just wanted to make sure that he made them alive, more alive than where they were at that moment, you know, more present, more aware, like, is that interesting, is it not interesting, what are you finding interesting about it, what are you not, like, just, just have an opinion, whether you like it or not, as long as I'm waking you up and bringing some excitement in your life, you know, that's, that's the beauty about entertainment, we are really taking people and putting them into another fantasy state of their, of existence, and they might need that. They might need that moment of inspiration or creativity based on a, a phrase that you created with somebody up in the air or somebody being, you know, you know, stacked three high or whatever. It, it makes you think different and be different. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Take my head off. You got it. You got it right there. That's, that's what it is. Well, Christopher, so we're at the, the we're coming close to the end of this. So I love to share with the audience, I call it the lucky seven, right? Seven questions right off the top of your head as fast as possible with answering. Um, and the first one goes like this. What is your favorite drink? Oh, well, uh, is it a, a li liquor drink? Or sure, it doesn't drink? matter. It could be liquor, non-alcoholic, or whatever. Well, well, my favorite drink is coconut water. I always drink it. But my favorite alcoholic drink right now is the Jack and Ginger. A Jack and Ginger. All right, perfect. Uh, where do you want to travel to? Well, some someplace I've never been is the Easter Island. Oh, Easter Island. The Easter Island. Yeah, Chile, Lake, south uh, to the left, right? I guess, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I know that I've, had, I've set my sights on that, and I have yet to be there. Got it. Um, favorite actor? Um, Robin Williams. Oh, yeah, he's good, he's good. I <laughs> like people that can make you laugh. He was always great. Um, Paul Newman. Paul Newman. Yeah, he's a good person. I met Paul Newman three times in, like, from 2005 to 2008, and I was like, <gasps> and then he came to a, a summer camp that I taught, and... Uh, to meet his wife Joanne Woodworth, and and she like congratulated me because I was working with their grandson. So I was like, oh, I didn't know what to say. I was literally star starstruck when she came up to me. I was like, I don't, I know who you are, but I don't know everything, and I just know you're a powerful person. So I'll just keep quiet. <laughs> he has this summer camp that he does in the summer times uh, for kids that can't go to regular camps, and it's it, it's an amazing amazing uh, place where all his friends, the stars and celebrities, come in. And uh, and Joanna Woodward is running it now. Yeah. Is, uh, right. Yeah. And uh, and we got to do that three times for him, including on Lincoln Center. So he, he was a, he's an amazing man, amazing man to work with, and a great actor. But uh, but I would say Robin Williams, and uh, I I know I love Hugh Jackman too. He's great. Yeah, he's versatile. Okay. Uh, cat lover or dog lover? Or animal um, lover? I, I'm an animal lover altogether, and I've had cats, but. I have Newton right now, and he's my he's my pet, and he's my favorite guy, and I love dogs. Always have, ever since I was a kid. What what is what is Newton as far as the breed? Well, he's a he's a miniature poodle, <laughs> but um, but but he, we don't dress him like one. He's got a mohawk that goes all the way down his back, and we color it according to the season. So um, so he doesn't look like, much like a poodle. He uh he, he looks like some kind of crazy creature. Right now, he's colored like a caterpillar for the Easter parade coming up. Oh, got it. If there, if there was a person that you would like to meet today, who would it be and why? I mean, I want to meet President Barack Obama. Got it. And I want to ask him, uh, I really want to ask him if, uh, basically, because he we did a performance for him. Yeah, the inauguration. I mean, yeah. At his inauguration. But we never got to, uh, I never got to meet him during that because of all the security. And um, and I would want to meet him just because I think that, I think that if there's any one person right now that's going to help us through this crazy, crazy time on this planet who understands uh, what's going on, it would be him. 
Got it. Um, I know that you're learning Japanese at the moment, but what's another language you would love to learn? I, whenever I go to any, any place, I always learn a little bit of the language. Uh, so I, I can't say any, any one. I just, where, wherever I go, I pick up all the cordials and then um, and, and a little bit more of it. But, I mean, if I had another one under my belt, uh, I'm getting closer on Portuguese. I'd love to have that one under my belt. That's a great language. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Last thing, it's really important, but what is your favorite dessert? <laughs> Anything with fruit. With Anything with passion fruit. I love passion fruit. <laughs> this is Maracuja, like... they call it in Brazil. What do they call it in Brazil? In Brazil, they call it maracujá, and they have all these amazing desserts they do with it. And uh, and ever, ever since that, it's one of the beautiful things about traveling the world is you get to understand different cultures. And ever since I had their passion fruit desserts there, I... I, whenever they, whenever there's one, that's what I order. <laughs> that's, that's great. Now, Christopher, um, what are some places that people can go and find your information online, from your websites to social media accounts? I'm just, you know, I'm also going to add this into the the description of the, on the page, um, but so that people here right now can take action to listen and, and to watch your stuff that you're doing online. Well, the uh, my my company is, is has two different sectors: anti gravity entertainment and anti gravity fitness. The Anti-Gravity Entertainment website is uh, www.anti-gravity.com, and there you can see the timeline and videos of stuff that we've done over the years. Um, the uh, Anti-Gravity Fitness website is www.antigravityfitness.com, and that's going to show you all the different techniques that we've got and uh, and what we've been doing with that. And then if you want to, to visit my website, um, I think it's Christopher Harrison NYC. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. You can Perfect. find me there. Or you can go online on YouTube and look at uh, anti-gravity, or your, your channel, the anti-gravity channel, or Christopher Harrison channel, I believe it is. Yeah, Christopher Harrison NYC, maybe, or Christopher Harrison channel. Sure. This is, uh, thank you so much for your time. I'm so happy that Kyle introduced me into you and that we've, you know, shared this moment of your life. It's a, it's a glimpse, but it's going to stay forever. So <laughs> with that being said, um, thank you for everything, Christopher, and uh, I can't wait to share this over the weekend. You're welcome. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, Edwin. It's really good stuff. Hey, everyone. This is Edwin Overa from edwinovera.com, a.k.a. the successful freelance dancer. And I'm here right now in Philadelphia, actually on my last day. Um, I was doing a four-day residency here at Kappa, which is the High School for the Arts. It's, a, it's like the second oldest high school, uh, high school for the Arts in the United States. Um, and it's a, a very special place for me as a teaching artist on behalf of Palabalus to come and work with um, my guest, mm -hmm. Ladiva, Ladiva M. Davis. She is the artistic director um, and also the pioneer of this program here at Kappa. Uh, I'll just share a couple of facts that I uh, did my research on with, uh, before the interview. Um, she has her bachelor's degree from the University of Philadelphia Music Academy. When she was younger, she spent a lot of time at Alvin Ailey and also at the Dance Theater of Harlem. In about in 1975 to 1976, she had her own nationally televised um, uh, TV show for cooking, which was called um, What was it called? Uh, it was called What's Cooking. What's Cooking with Ladiva Davis. With Ladiva Davis, and it's also there's a, um, a permanent um, a permanent. Uh, Exhibit. exhibit for it at the Smithsonian Institute, which is like unbelievable. You you had mentioned that you were the basically the first. Um, it was supposed to be the first African American woman to have her own nationally syndicated public television cooking show prior to the Food Network. Oh my goodness, that is a mouthful! But we have it all. Ladiva's life is absolutely amazing. Uh, other things is she was a, a regular on the Michael Doug Douglas um, show, which is for NBC. Um, your show was aired on over a hundred. Um, PBS, PBS stations. stations, and you said Virgin, Island, Virgin, Virgin Islands, Islands and Guam, Guam unbelievable. Alaska. You've been an educator for the... Uh, Since as 1965. Yeah, so 51 years. That's what it's going That's, into. Yeah. I, I saw, um, prior to this interview, I watched this 50-year tri uh, tribute, and I got incredibly emotional. <laughs> and the reason why I got so emotional is because I know what it felt like to be a teaching artist even just for 11 years. And the fact that you've really committed your life 50 years to, to, to your community. Some people have called you like um, uh, uh, a beacon in your community, or, or a pillar in your community. 
Um, My. Yes, uh, that was uh, from, uh, what is it, a, oh, a cheerleader for the children. Oh. Yeah, this is, this is uh, amazing how people view you in your life as an educator within your own community. I mean, I, I know I have 11 years, but to think, you know, times that even more, and all the journeys that you've gone through, and all the lives of your students that you have seen grow and become artists or people or professionals. Um, I go back to that 50 year tribute because to see you on stage, the center stage, that spotlight on you, and to have all those dancers coming in, giving you the roses, the white oh, flowers. Oh, it was an ugly cry. I mean, it was, well, the snot was everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the. It was just, I couldn't, I couldn't even fathom. I can't even explain to you how I felt. I really, it was just, it was so overwhelming. And, and to see the alumni come back and dance. Absolutely, me. from different.